the gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. So we're here today with Maria Kolodnitska, who is the Supply Chain Inspection Manager for EDF in the UK. Maria, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Brad. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, no, I know that you met up with one of our colleagues and um, it came highly recommended. And so I'm just super excited to chat about what you do. But before we get there, love to just learn about you as a person. Tell us, where did you grow up? Well, I, I was actually born in the north of Ukraine. Okay. And uh, part of the area was contaminated by by outfall from Chernobyl. Um, so in some ways, I, I learned about nuclear from a very early age and um because my family is quite academical, uh, we used to have this like encyclopedia about nuclear and sort of lessons learned from Chernobyl. Wow. Which, uh, because you know, I'm I'm quite keen reader. I read everything, yeah. so <laughs> that was just one of the things I sort of read. Wow, um, it drove you straight into the industry. Yeah. Well, 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 that's it. You know, it was kind of eighties, and there was no internet, and yeah. How, how old were you at the time when Chernobyl happened? Um, I was two. Okay. So, so yeah, so you're in the target range of when people or people who were quite concerned. Um, can I ask what your what your parents do at that time? What was their professions? Yeah, yeah. So so they're, they're both both engineers, which is why you can imagine that the conversations we've kind of been having at the table were quite sort of different. Yeah. And also because they're both engineers, we kept meeting maybe people that were not quite sort of common for people to meet. So we actually um, ended up talking to um, to this really brilliant guy on actually when we were on holiday, and he ended up being one of the designers for Sarcophagus for Chernobyl. So again, you know, you you were just surrounded by that, and um, and also where we grew up, we had um, another um, just ne neighbor who happened to be a firefighter. So I, I just learned about that really from really early on. And um, I'm going to ask you a few more stories about your childhood, but just to like put it all in context, when did you leave the country and are your parents still there or did they leave as well? Uh, so I have left in uh, 2005. So that's what now, 17 years ago, okay. um, because I, you know, I've, I've did my first degree in Ukraine and then I moved to do my my master's. But you don't have any of the accent. I, I, I do. I do. But I think, you know, it, it's been it's been a while and I've been sort of trying to fit in. Wow. So I've been uh, tr trying to get rid of my accent. Um, but yeah, because I mean, you were there for like 20 years. So it's hard to shed an accent for that. That's incredible. Um, um, well, but you could probably turn it back on when you go back home. Well, 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 perhaps, perhaps. Um, I think what my husband likes to say that when, when, when we're in Ukraine, because he's English, so he doesn't speak any Ukrainian. Uh, well, he speaks ten words. Um, the important words, like you know, names of food and small small animals, but not not to properly have a conversation. Um, so he says that the way I speak sort of changes when I'm there. So so perhaps you're right. My yeah, accent would be stronger. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, if you don't mind, can I ask a few more questions? If it's about the culture course, and mentality yeah. around Chernobyl and Ukraine at that time. Of course, yeah. Um, Okay, so like when you were five or six, let's say five ages five through ten, what were you told yeah. about it? And were you still in that same area, or did they, had people moved around uh, after that? Um, so, so I was still in the same area because basically I, I sort of grew up in a in a like a county town, perhaps is the easiest way to, exp to yeah, no, describe I get that. It. Yeah. So the north of the county was was contaminated uh, to to the level that people couldn't live there anymore. So they they had to be. Um, effectively removed um, because it wasn't safe for them. But the town itself was was absolutely fine. But because I was a child, so it was seen to be as kind of high risk. Then um, we were all given like little radiation passports, so you you, you kind of became a radiation worker at a, at a very young young age. So 
um, you know, so, sometimes I sort of like to joke that I've joined the industry 40 years ago, but they only pay me for, for 16 years out of that. So, so just so I understand this radiation passport concept, this is to prevent movement of people into radiological contaminated areas, you have to um, have a reason? Not, not quite. They're, they're two different things. So the first one is, depending which area you lived at the time when the accident happened, you could either uh, stay where you were, or you were given an option to to move. So you were given, you know, free accommodation. Oh, this passport was to leave. To... <laughs> no, no, no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not explaining that. So, uh, so the little passport tell you uh, what was the dose that you received. So it was like. Um, oh, it's like a medical, like a like medical, like a medical passport. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. It, so it's not, it's not okay. like a passport to move. But it's not about restricting that. transfer. Okay, yeah. Okay. That's right, yeah. But but separate to that, uh, based on the area where people lived, then you could either stay there or were forced to move or had an option to move. So I was in the area where it was safe to stay, yeah. but because I was a baby or a toddler, then I was given this radiation passport as a kind of medical you know, you've received a dose of radiation, which at the time I found brilliantly exciting because yeah. um, it felt really special. Well, actually, oh man, that is super interesting. Like that is worth like, man, I wish we could like talk to a whole bunch of people like you with some like trained professionals about psychology to actually yeah. inform radiation communication in like today's day and age and like how we present it to people because i think whatever we're doing right now makes it scarier than it is that's this is my you know opinion um and there are very exciting things about radiation because radiation isn't just hazard like radiation is like a form of energy transfer i mean yeah. like you go out and you bask in the sun that's radiation too obviously okay you know there's ionizing not ionizing i get it but it's like, there is some level, I mean, you use the word special, which is just so awesome that as a child, that's how you thought of something that everyone else thought was hazardous. And so I'm just, there's just a nugget in there that I wish we could explore, but maybe for a different conversation. Sorry. Yep, that was yep, a little bit absolutely. Um, do you remember what the dose was? Uh, well, r rather than helpfully, it was in a different dose units. Uh, <laughs> so o o obviously in the uh, sort of UK and Western world, we deal more with sort of Becquerels and Zivids, but in uh, in the sort of what was Soviet Union, it was more Curies and Rongans. Right. So, yeah. so it just wouldn't wouldn't quite quite help to explain it. But one thing that I could tell you was um, that when I um, when I converted it, because I was curious, you know, when I when I sort of grew up, and I was like, oh, I wonder what it was like. So through my entire um, entire time working in the industry, I got virtually nothing comparing to what I got as a little toddler. And even that wasn't actually quite, quite that exciting in the grand scheme of things. Um, and I'll tell you another little anecdote, if I may. Please. So um, I've, um, I did my first degree in environmental engineering back in Ukraine. And because, uh, you know, we looked at all of the um, environmental subjects and environmental concerns in the areas, we studied things like radiation protection, which was entirely normal. Um, so then it was also entirely normal for me to do a bachelor's dissertation into um, distribution of cesium in forest ecosystems. And um, when I went to collect effectively forest samples, so things like, you know, cranberries and mushrooms and bark and soil and, you know, cones and lots of other bits of forest, and, and then sort of analyze in the lab you know, how much did accumulate cesium, strontium, and other radionuclides. Um, some of the mushrooms that we were picking as part of the um, research, by the standards of, of UK, would be cr classed as low-level waste. Yeah. yeah? So, yeah. formally radioactive waste. Yep. And what was what was really telling, because, you know, this is um, just like painting the picture. So the forest in the north of Ukraine is this like beautiful sort of primeval forest. There are no people for miles because it's, you know, very, very sort of isolated, uh, quite, quite fairy like. It's quite magical. Um, and we had a forest guide to sort of help us to find, you know, the right parts of the forest because you could get lost there quite easily. And as we were heading back. And I was with with my um, 
my um, supervisor, um, the um, so the local guide just gave us this kind of bunch of mushrooms. Say, oh look, you know, there you go, guys. I've found some mushrooms for you. Why don't you fry them or make a soup? And my supervisor and I were like. <laughs> Yeah, but I know it's funny, but on the other hand, in reality, it's like the regulatory limits are probably orders of magnitude lower than they need to be. You know, it probably would have been fine. I, I guess I'm I'm wondering, like, how they calculated the, that initial dose for you. Like, it's not like they took biological samples from you, right? So they were probably doing estimations based on, like, surface level contamination that they picked up doing some survey after the fact. Uh, I I think I don't think it was quite as um, as precise as that. So I think what they looked at was, uh, you know, a typical age at the time. What would be your diet? So are you still on milk or are you on kind of solids? Uh, what was the typical time you'd sp you spend outside? Because you know it, it wasn't just me being really special having this little radiation passport. There were lots of children of sort of similar age who would have them. Sure. Um, so I, I I doubt very much, but you know. I don't know because I was a toddler uh, yeah. that they sort of actually took physical samples to kind of do it properly. I think it was more more a a prediction and an estimation rather than a sort of specific calculation. And did they do um, increased checkups on, let's say, like your thyroid throughout your yes. upbringing? Yeah. And do you like yes. like how was that conducted? Did the state send people around? And do you like do you remember that experience? Um, you just go to the doctor well, and tell them, hey, you, like you're, you're going very far, far back and quite deep. Um, I think from memory, it was it was as simple as you know, when you're at school, you just get sort of a checkup in the same way as you get your like vaccinations done through school. So there'll be like a person turn up and say, you know, today we're looking at everybody th thyroids. How do you feel? Um, so it was to to me that was quite normal. You know, now when you're asking the question, yeah. it sounds like a little bit weird, but it was yeah. quite normal. <laughs> One of the things that I'm like very personally interested in, uh, specifically with respect to the um, incidence of cancer as a result of Chernobyl, is um, is the screening effect. And Ooh. it seems to me that all of the um, all of the statistical models that we have today ignore the screening effect. And so, what I would love to understand, and you probably don't have this information, but I'm just kind of like telling you what I'm curious about, is what where where is their differ, differential amount of thyroid inspection in different areas or was it it was there like a control group where you know they screened a population that they knew wasn't contaminated so they could account for that screening effect because you know what they say about cancer when you look for cancer you find cancer <laughs> i i think i think that's a good point brett and i would imagine that probably whole um you know if not un research universities but certainly very dedicated professors who would have looked at elements of that who would give you a much better educated answer <laughs> I, I think i can only talk from sort of my, my personal experience through the lens of uh, you know childhood which which in some ways would be spot on and accurate in other ways uh would have you know the rose tinted spectacles or the other way around yeah 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 uh after 500 podcasts, I'm still tracking down the answers. <laughs> but no, but I can't tell you how much I actually appreciate hearing your experience. Um, actually, the human stories is one of, one of the best parts of, of doing this podcast in general. Okay, so, so you went on to be an um, environmental engineer. Um, you know, walk me through that. Then, you know, what would your career look like moving forward? Yeah, so, um, so basically, after graduating as an environmental engineer, um, then... It so happens that all of my family have sort of moved abroad. So my, my sister moved to UK, my parents lived in Denmark, and then eventually moved to UK um, kind of for economical reasons. Um, and then the rest of them were also putting pressure on me in terms of, don't you think it would be a good idea for you to do your master's elsewhere? <laughs> for example, Europe, for example, UK. Um, so I ended up um, doing master's in UK uh, on environmental management. And what was quite interesting, sort of coming from you know a deeply technical engineering um, academical family, that was the first time when I sort of did a course uh, that had no equations and no graphs, and I was like, I'm studying something which is all about you know reasoned arguments and you know 
conversations with people. You can't actually measure any of that. Um, so that's quite interesting. But the, my, my master's was in climate change, which uh, which felt really relevant at the time. And obviously now um, gets even more. What year was that again? What year was that? Um, so what, what year? So that was 2005. 2005. And they were already talking about climate change then. Well, uh, so I was I was really lucky because I, I studied in, in Oxford um, as a city, but it was Oxford, Oxford Brooks University, not, not the the main exciting historic one but because it was based in Oxford um there was quite a lot of really early um kind of climate scientists in that area because it's you know it's, it's a very academic very clever sort of city um and I happened to have a um an MSc supervisor who was you know one of the um sort of pioneering experts at the time um and when I was looking into how well the UK um, sort of regional authorities were getting ready for adapting to climate change causes, uh, and you know, cutting long story short, the conclusion was they weren't really getting ready at that point. Yeah, I was going to say, who even cared in two thousand five? <laughs> well, yeah. well, that's it, Brad. I think there were very few people who even cared. You know, and there were yeah. still <laughs> some people who didn't even believe in it. It was it was quite different times, really. So, can I, um, can I ask? Um, do you notice a marked change as to when it became like a political issue? Because like when you first got started, nobody cared. It probably wasn't political. Do you remember when it became political? Um, so I think it's probably more like 10 years ago, kind of became mainstream. And obviously now it's it's recognized as a, you know, the evidence is there. So there is a very, very, very small number of people who no longer believe in man-made climate change. There are, there are some exceptions, but there would be, you know. In, any in the U.S., it's I think it's like 50 percent of people still. But it's more of a feeling. It's not like people arguing on the scientific merits. It's just more like I don't want people telling me what to do. So here's my belief, um, I think. Yes. So, so it was different at that point. But I think um, what was kind of interesting about doing that course, um, when I later told people that I got a job with nuclear, they kind of all like looked at me and was like, why nuclear? And I'm like, why not? You know? <laughs> so for, for most of them, it, it would have never even occurred for them to do nuclear as a career uh, full stop, you know, let alone do nuclear as a, as a career for somebody who cares about environment. Uh, whilst for me, that felt entirely natural. Yeah. And I think maybe what sort of helped is when I when I did my um, my sort of jo job interview with uh, a company called Magnox, which in UK is a uh, fast generator. So it's both a reactor type and a company that used to um, sort of design, build and operate uh, that reactor type. Um, so when I kind of went to my job interview and I just remember going through this like really 60s looking building and there was just like steel and concrete everywhere, you know, massive pipes. And I walked into a room and there was a room full of engineers who asked me sort of technical questions. And, and I remember for the first time, and that was you know, a year since I, since I sort of moved countries, I felt like, you know what, I, I, I could probably live here because I felt like I belonged. Cool. That's really cool. Yeah, cause you're, yeah, an engineer at home. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so tell me about that job. What what like what were you getting into? What were your responsibilities? And then I also want to hear a little bit about Magnox in general. Um, just like as a technology and you know history of it. If you have just any thoughts to share there too. Yeah. So um, so Magnox as a as a company. So that was the first generation of. Uh, uh, gas cooled reactors, and it stands for Magnox non oxidizing alloy, um, which I think most people probably know. Um, so at the time, it had 10 nuclear power stations. So all of them have the same reactor type, but because they were being constructed uh, at slightly different timescales, they're all a little bit different. Um, so I, I joined as a graduate into, into engineering team um, and for me, that was just, you know, a, a way to kind of learn, learn the trade, learn more about the industry. Um, and what was interesting about that, that the team I joined, so the, the, sort of most people in their team, they were at least double my age. And yeah. um, some of them were triple my age, which was, which was fascinating. Um, nuclear industry for you comes in waves. Well, 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 that's it. You know, and when I kind of tell people that, nobody even is surprised by that fact. Um, <laughs> and there was so additional, you know, dimension where there was a very small number of women in the department. You know, especially sort of technical, especially senior women. 
and uh, that I was very lucky to have uh, actually my first line manager was a woman, which I, I didn't realize just how lucky I was until much later on. Um, and then I had this you know, additional dimension of being uh, somebody who has English, English as, as my, not my first language, well, it's, it's actually my third language. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of, you know, very interesting environment to be um, immersed into, but everybody was really lovely to me and really helped me to kind of learn and develop and grow. And uh, over the sort of eight years that followed, then I um, did a number of technical jobs. So it was different specialism in environment, picked up radioactive waste, um, also decommissioning strategy. And eventually I progressed all the way to being head of environment at, at Barclay site, which was one of the power stations that was being decommissioned. Um, and maybe the interesting thing about Barclay is that it's, um, it was the very first, you know, fully commercial nuclear power station in the UK. Cool, cool. So when you joined the industry, what was the, were they done building at that point? Was like the Magnox technology only on its way down and everyone knew it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so, so, what was the reason articulated for why the UK would be switching to light water reactors when it had the history in the gas cooled reactors? So, so at, at the time I was joining, the industry was very much in decline, I would say. Mm -hmm. So the, the Magnus reactors were, some of them already started to be decommissioned. Others were on the kind of last years of generation because they were the first time. Uh, and then so the second generation we have are advanced um, gas reactors, so AGRs. Uh, so those were all operating at the time. And sorry, what was the difference between the first and second generation, technically? I think I'm probably not the right person to answer that because I would I would I would not give you a good answer. I think, um, I think it was more of an evolution rather than revolution because okay. what, what I do know is that from the last of the Magnox sites and the first of the AGR sites, for a bit you could exchange spares for particular bits of the of the equipment. So I think it's you know it was it was kind of an ongoing development where the last of the Magnox or the first of the jars was sort of a step change, but not quite the, um, you know, the, the huge step change between those. Got it. Got it. That's very interesting. And then, um, so, and then so decommissioning was a big focus um, at that yeah. point. So yeah. what, what are the decommissioning characteristics of these facilities? Like, is there, can you give us just like a mental framework to how we should think about decommissioning? Um, so de decommissioning is, uh, it has two parts. Um, first one is about dealing with waste. So making sure that, you know, radioactive waste is, is retrieved, processed and stored appropriately. And then the second bit is, is demolition really. So it's, it's more, more conventional demolition in places, um, slightly more tricky in others. Um, and then that, that's kind of it, but you know, so on the face of it, it's not that complex. And then yeah. on that first part, it's then broken up into three pieces, high level, intermediate, low level waste. That's, co that's correct, yeah. Where does it go? In the UK, where does it go? Well, there is also a good question. So for for UK, we have a uh, low level waste repository and that has existed you know, for, for, for decades and is a pretty known route for waste. Uh, so intermediate level waste and high level waste currently do not have a repository in the UK. So there is a um, a repository plant, which is going to be a, a deep geological disposal facility. Um, but it's they're currently at the sort of planning, finding the right site, um, designing, because it's going to be quite quite a sort of large and complex facility when it comes around. And can you um, give me an example of what might be intermediate level waste and what do they physically do with it when they are tearing down the building if they don't have a repository for it? Yeah, so uh, for, for intermediate level waste, um, you, you have so, so, some things are quite simple, you know, like filters when, when you when you have your um, the you're sort of ca capturing the reductivity in your system, you have filters that obviously capture it because you're accumulating it all. So then they become reductive waste. Um, so in Magnox, we um, we, we have this um, bits of kind of fuel elements. So there were like little metal fins that got cut off before fuel was sent for reprocessing. So they also become uh, intermediate level waste. Um, then you have like resins. So, so, so it's 
it's largely to do with kind of water treatment cycles uh, and a bit of a fuel pre-processing waste and another like miscellaneous um, stuff that got sort of activated or, or, or contaminated. Like primary pipes or something like that or? Uh, well, because because basically for for um, for Magnox, the, the strategy, and you know, clearly I've. I've oh, I've sorry, I was it. thinking water and, based. And, and, yeah, I sorry. Yeah, I yeah. Uh, because the the main sort of strategy for Magnox is that you deal with a waste that's that's um, not in the best position currently being stored, but you do not deal with primary circuit uh, decommissioning at that stage. So okay. you leave it in a safe store. For that, uh, for the for you know your primary pipes, as you're saying, to to decay because from um, radionuclides perspective, uh, the biggest fingerprint is cobalt sixty, which has a half life of what? Of uh, I think it's five years, if my memory serves me right. So, you, so how you, long you, do you let it sit? Yeah. Um. So you you let it sit for a long time. So it could be you know as long as eighty years. Um, how long? So how long? Eighty years. So it's a 80, long time. Eighty. Eighty. Okay. Yeah. So there. So there. The intended plan for these facilities is to let the cobalt 60 contaminated areas just be in place for 80 years before they disassemble and put on trucks and move it somewhere. Yes. Yeah. And and for, sorry, just once again, for the intermediate level waste that is easy to grab and move um, and has maybe a shorter half-life, like the resins or whatever, what do they physically do with that, like right now? Uh, well, I, I, I think it's it's been obviously a while since I've worked in in my or not right now when you were when you were doing it what did they physically do with it did they just put it in a bucket somewhere on site or did they put it in a bucket on someone else's site or what they... so, so, so it would be it would be retrieved from its current location process which would be either encapsulation or storage and then put it in a purpose-built um radioactive waste storage facility because I think you know and I'll, and I'll say this one last point and that then um perhaps we can move on so when magnox reactors were built they were considered to be infrastructure um in the same way as now you wouldn't think of decommissioning you know a motorway <laughs> like right. it just wasn't thought at that point so people have operated and put waste sort of underground without really planning to retrieve it because that was not the thinking at the time Yep. But since that, um, there has been you know, a, a substantial change in waste strategy, and I'm sure that even in the in the last sort of eight years that I've left Magnox, they probably moved on to different thinking as well. So it wouldn't be right for me to to go into too much because yeah, it's a bit out of that knowledge. That's fine. I'm not trying to like play gotcha with anyone. I'm just curious about how different strategies are employed in different countries around the world because like I'm always just looking for whatever the most reasonable thing someone does somewhere in the world. Like, let's just apply that other places um, and not like try to get too clever with our solutions, which I feel like in the nuclear industry, we do a lot. We, we, we like we like making hard engineering problems for ourselves. Hmm. Um, okay, so Horizon Nuclear Power, tell me about that. Yes, yeah, so um, after I um, so spent obviously a number of years in Magnox, um, just as I was... Um, Sort of progressing, you know, with my head of environment role, new build became a thing. So there was a change in in the government policy, and there was this excitement and buzz about, oh, we might actually build some new ones. And I thought, well, that would be fun. <laughs> so um, I uh, got attracted by sort of the, sh the shiny lights of new build, and um, moved across. First, I led uh, environmental team uh, in Horizon that was that was growing, and then I. Um, moved to lead project engineering uh, team. Um, and what was it kind of interesting about that, that I got to look at totality of design for consent. So we needed to get a number of permissions and it was, um, I sort of like to think of it as a kind of, like it's like a helicopter view. So I wasn't responsible for, my team wasn't responsible for one design to kind of absolute detail. It was just more, does it all fit together in a way that we could communicate to both government and our local regulatory bodies as well as national regulatory bodies and also to our local community what is it we're actually trying to build and why yep and what was it that you were trying to build and where <laughs> so uh, we were trying to build an abwr and we were 
um, planning to build it in a place called Anglesey. Um, so it was a Wilfa Wilfa Newth. So it's new new Wilfa. That's Wilfa an in the... island off of Wales, right? That's correct. Yeah. So it's, yeah. so it's a, I've been um, out there. I've been I've been out there. Yeah. Have you? Only two little bridges <laughs> over there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think it's so Bangor can, University. Is Bangor University out there? Yes, yeah, yeah. I visited right. Bangor. Yeah. So, so Bangor is technically not in Anglesey, just across the bridge. I so went across also. Gateway. I, I, I gateway went over. Gateway to Anglesey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I crossed the one of those bridges. Um, amazing. So then, um, yeah, I mean that whole part of the country is beautiful. I mean, all, that part of the world is beautiful. I just love that that whole setting and. Yeah, it's it just you know take. I took a train through North Wales and enjoyed every minute of it. Oh, it's it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful country and beautiful part of the country. It also has its own like microclimate as well, which is quite unique. It's uh, yeah, it's brilliant. Uh, but then, as you you know, as you probably know, um, Horizon uh, didn't get the the funding, so uh, there is no power station being being built um, currently at Wilfa. But I'm I'm privately hoping that you know one day maybe somebody else will build one because it's you know, it's it's the best. Time. I think there's a lot of interest right now. I just think that, um, oh man, it's like any of these giant construction projects are going to be a nightmare from a like a logistical perspective. And I know that it, that site is just so attractive for a lot of reasons, including like, you know, the water cooling and where it is. But I heard they were going to have to like build a new port just to like ship in some of the components. I'm not sure if that's still the plan for these new projects, but I man, it's just like, any major infrastructure that requires other major infrastructure, man, that is a nightmare. Um, and uh, you know that's why I wish the industry would you know, try to find a way to do these projects. I mean, I love gigawatt scale projects. I hope we build a ton of them. I just wish they figured out a way to do them in, in like more of like a, a lightweight way, like we like we used to. Um, but maybe those are more like half gigawatt ones. Um, anyway, um, okay. Uh, and then what came next for you? Yeah, so, so then obviously after Horizon um, closed down, I thought I would quite like to build a power station. So it was that kind of, you know, power station shaped hole in my in my life. And there was only one of them going, which is, you know, Hinkley Point and C. So that was a very easy, easy choice for me. And um, so I joined EDF um, to um, to build Hinkley Point C. Um, and I've been in, with EDF for coming up to four years. And over the course of that, I've done a range of um, governance roles and also some transformational projects as well. Uh, so now I am part of an internal nuclear regulator and I look after supply chain inspection. What does that mean, internal nuclear regulator? I haven't actually heard that term. Yes, yeah, so, so this is, um, I'm not sure it's quite unique to UK, but it is not, it's not necessarily common um, across all operators. So you know like how you've got your, your external regulator, so like, you know, like environmental protection agency or somebody like that. So we've got those two, obviously, we have um, Office for Nuclear Regulation and we have Environment Agency and others. So they're external regulator. What's what's different between UK system and say US system, so that our regulators are not prescriptive. Um, I, so I love it, the SAP framework, I love it so much. I've read every SAP back and forth. I read, I've read the task, I've read the, um, the guidance to the inspectors on every SAP also. No, I love the framework. Well, this is commitment, Brett. I like it. Um, so whilst the sort of the internal nuclear regulator, so we are um we're like a mini, mini ONR. So we operate in a very similar way where we we have mandate to go anywhere, look at anything, you know, ask lots of difficult questions, uh, provide recommendations to the business. Um, we could um tell the business what to improve. We could stop activities if needed to, uh, but day to day it's, it's more around providing advice and guidance. And so the, the benefit of, of doing that is um, because we're still in the company. So that means, you know, we, we get to see a lot more about, you know, understanding the company context, um, understanding, you know, how the different sort of teams work together a bit more that perhaps external regulator would do. Uh, but because we sit sort of separately, that means we have that independence uh, that we're we're not. Um, You're not invested in the design choices. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, not emotionally invested in the design choices. Yeah. Okay. Um, and 
tell me about the supply chain then and like what do you do to make sure everything's up up to quality standards and it's not like what like what are, okay, actually let me ask the question differently what are the major risks um from your perspective that like your job is there to catch uh before they become problems like with respect to the supply chain like is it just quality standards not having documentation is it actually performance of the equipment what is it that you're looking for yes yeah, so, so so um maybe let me just explain a little bit about what the role the role actually is um so as you probably know um Hinkley Point C is the largest construction site in, in Europe. And um, I lead a team, which are basically inspectors in their own right. So we inspect suppliers, which are um, international and UK um, based suppliers, but we also inspect our own company arrangements. And that includes quality arrangements, but that also includes other arrangements too. Um, and, and also just to tell you a little bit about our supply chain so it takes an awful lot of people to design manufacture and, inst and install a nuclear power station um so we've got 300 suppliers um where we're in in contract uh, with those for hpc and they in turn obviously have their own supply chain uh, and recently we've established that we have over 5,000 sub suppliers. Yeah, I was about to say 300 seems pretty light for a project. Well, well, ex well exactly. This is the you know, 300 <laughs> we have the direct relationship with. But okay, so just... like you might have a, a relationship with a top level supplier, which will be like your, like let's say someone who's going to install um, your cooling towers or something, right? And then they'll have each like the fan, the fan guy and the or fan company and the motor company and the concrete company underneath them. Is that the idea? So, 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 so yes, we're not having cooling towers at HPC, but ah, um, sorry, I did but, the idea. <laughs> but but you've got the idea. So if you've got you know um, some some sort of pump system, then uh, you've got one person who's doing the um, the pump case and another person that does a motor to that pump, um, and they could be you know all installed, in, sorry, all manufactured different factories. A third factory. Um, assembles it all together and tests it and then sort of ships it to us. Do, do um, you got, what, how do you guys organize your bill of materials? Do you have like a giant, like would you have a one piece of software that has everything in it that goes into your plant? Uh, I think a, a, sh a short answer is yes, but I think there'll be other people who'd be a better place to to explain how that works because we're, we're having like kilometers of pipe work and, and yeah i guess i'm wondering like how do you how do you organize and... like how do you organize your team's priority is like do you go down the list and say we're going to tackle you know this month we're going to tackle pipes and valves and this and that like how, yeah uh well i, th I think that the way that because uh, obviously we're quite we're a relatively small team with a very very large um supply chain and um, within that supply chain, there are lots of people doing things, you know, in, like in, in UK alone, we have 22,000 people who work uh, on, on HPC in some shape or form, Wild. Wild. Shape or form um, including you know, 8,000 that we've got um, on construction sites. So crazy. Oh, my God. So, so it's, you know, it's, it's quite, quite a large, uh, large scale. Well, it's, it's a large scale project. So that's the only way yeah. I can describe it. Um, so the way, the way I approach it with my team is that we, we plan what we do. Um, every year and then we also make an allowance for kind of emergent activities yeah. and in planning what we do we we take note of what is the the safety significance of that equipment so you know if it's like a reactor pressure vessel you know absolutely we definitely want to to go to to those facilities and you know focus on a welding for reactor pressure vessel if it's a a valve that is on a conventional part of the plant and has no safety significance then we'll probably never look at that valve um and i think what's worth saying is that obviously there it's not just you know my team who does the inspection uh we're just the independent layer so there are other people who provide the um, the surveillance both on site and in the factories um and in really simple terms the more significant the bit of kit the more layers of inspection and surveillance we have. Do you have any good stories about like a particular part of the supply chain that you and your team got in there, found something interesting or that needs to be changed or resolved and saved the day? Uh, well, I'll, 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 I'll give you a, a different story, 
which is um, what I found personally more more sort of surprising. So I was um, early in the year when we we're doing this really large assessment into um, understanding how requirements get passed on to tier two supplier. And you know, so some of them were really known suppliers to us who've done work, work in France and um, been in the industry for you know decades and in a couple of cases, you know, almost a century, which is kind of as, as long as, as uh, industry been alive, really. But there was um, a tier three supplier that um, it sort of happened that they were manufacturing um, a, a bit of a boiler for us. Um, and before I went to the supplier, everybody's like, oh, but you know, these guys are like, they haven't worked in the industry. They're just not really going to know what our expectations are. And I was kind of going go there and they were in a place that didn't really have any nuclear expertise or, you know, as, as a country didn't have much nuclear presence. But when I went there, I found them to be actually excellent. <laughs> and that was that was quite quite surprising where I think sometimes as an industry, we think we know best and we we do everything best. And and, and the examples where we do. Um but we forget that there are other people who also do really good things. So it was yeah, yeah. it was quite sort of almost humbling to find a supplier who has not worked in the industry, uh, but they were able to raise the standard to a point that was actually, you know, even setting setting um, expectations and raising the bar, raising the bar is the word I was looking for, raising the bar for what the other company should be doing. That's so funny. You see, I, I almost have the opposite bias that since the nuclear industry doesn't build that often or that many things that the suppliers, I would assume, actually don't have as good processes or technology as, as those that, I mean, yeah, I know we're more heavily regulated, but I feel like other industries that build 10,000 of whatever the nuclear industry builds one of is going to naturally have a, a higher quality standards somewhere, not every company, obviously, but there's always going to be the best. There's going to be like, you know, the German co company or something that has like the you know, most precision or something um, uh, that, uh, yeah, that was, that's just usually my bias is that other industries um, have leapfrogged nuclear in terms of performance and quality of components just through sheer scale. And we're kind of holding on to, you know, using what I think are kind of like outdated methods, like, you know, just looking at like the, um, like the paperwork, uh, the paper trail of where, you know, the metallurgy came from as our like primary tools. I think we look at our requirements are perhaps more detailed than some of the other industries, not, not, not uniquely, you know, like airspace has, has more, um, more requirements. Yeah, airspace is a great example of something that they build a lot of and also has like extremely high regulatory standards. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to see yeah, like what we can borrow from the airspace industry in terms of high throughput components that do awesome things. Yes. So so and, and when we look at our at our suppliers, so often there is an overlap. So there would be fact because if there was like a factory that does valves, you know, they would do valves to whoever needs valves. So if there is a a factory that does um, um, like switch gear cupboards or, or something, you know, then, then they do it for other people too. And um, and some of them actually separate um, kind of the high hazard industries. So they would do, oh, this is our work for like nuclear airspace and oil and gas. Right. And this is our work for, you know, a warehouse or a shopping center or whatever is it they're doing because our quality requirements are, are more stringent, our records requirements uh, probably is the bit that actually stands out more. And I think sometimes when, when I go to factories and I talk to, talk to people on the shop floor, uh, there would be inevitably something people would complain about saying, oh, but why are, you, why are you so demanding? And you want us to produce all of this, you know, all of these extra tests and all of those different records. And then, then I actually, tell them some of the stories from decommissioning, that when you um, attempt to decommission something that was built like 60 years ago, and then you want to find a record to say, but how exactly do you take this thing apart? Or, you know, what is the thickness of this particular bit of equipment? And unless you have those records, it makes your life really, really hard. And, and, and you know, and guys who are manufacturing, 
they don't always appreciate that because they think, oh, you know, there is this particular widget that will be used for five years and then kind of thrown away. I'm like, no, no, some of these things we, we need to use for like 60 years or maybe even 100 years. And that's a very long time. I know, I know, but it still troubles me that, you know, because I think there's unintended consequences. I think it's great for us to say, yeah, we want all of these records, but we don't real. I mean, but the unintended consequences are almost twofold. One is that now we're going to limit the pool of suppliers that are willing to even participate in our industry. And we might be boxing out some of the most innovative suppliers that have, you know, like let's say it's an electrical cabinet. There might be some incredible innovation in terms of temperature control or monitoring or digital, you know, add-ons or auxiliary equipment that, you know, there's only a few companies, you know, that do that. And they are simply not willing to do it and also do it to the, you know, the nuclear record standards. And now we don't get the benefit from advances in technology. So that's like one unintended consequence that I'm like quite troubled by. And then the other is I think that we, you know, we're driving up cost past the point of the benefit. And so, you know, in your example where it's like, okay, we want to know what the dimensions are of this thing 60 years from now. Um, is it really worth it to make that component 10 times more expensive and the societal implications of nuclear being 10 times more expensive than it needs to be just to not get more innovative 60 years from now on how we decommission things? Um, these are just some of my thoughts on, on the topic. Uh, yeah. That's probably a discussion in its own, I think. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and tell me about um, Great British Nuclear Task Force. Yeah, so, so I think, uh, well, Great British Nuclear was was actually really unexpected opportunity for me. Um, so as you as you, you might be aware, um, we have a bit of an energy security uh, um, challenge, opportunity, energy security challenge and opportunity in its own right. Um, and I think it's it's not unique to UK, it's, it's similar to all countries, and I think they became even more more important after obviously Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, so a, um, our then Prime Minister, uh, Boris Johnson, decided to um, set up a, um, a task force to scope what great, what is it we could do differently uh, as a nuclear industry. And then we had a, an exciting name of Great British Nuclear, sort of scoping team. And um, what I really liked about that was that I got to meet so many really amazing people who were in in government, and uh, as well as you know people from industry, and engage with with operators and others properly internationally. So it felt like like planet Earth, you know, nuclear team in some ways. Um, and I think what was really nice about that that uh, before I sort of joined that task force. Um, I perhaps had a bit of an imposter syndrome and I didn't quite realize that I have excellent ability to analyze information and I have real reputation for delivery and just doing things that nobody else knows how to do. Um, but having, you know, having done it for three and a half months, um, looking back on it is, is quite exciting because I got to develop recommendations for operating model and I got to define the functions, what the future organization would look like, what would be the, the future role of GBN if, if government did decide to uh, to start this new company. Yeah, we're, we're um, all wondering, what is the future of GBN? Do we know right now? Well, well, I think you need to give a you know call to Rishi Sunak. He probably knows. So the um, the latest and update... Does, is he, do you think he's like involved at that level? Like he's like personally invested? Oh, yeah. And understand. Okay. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, absolutely. It's like, like a weekly brief even on like, what's our latest at GBN or like... How important so, actually is this at that level? Uh, well, I think it's you know it's, it's a question question to Rishi, not to myself. But the the recommendation that I was developing as a as a, as a scope, scoping team in the summer were being briefed at prime minister level, so it's 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 that that important. Um, but obviously, until government makes an announcement, uh, then we don't really know what they're thinking. So it's it's not it's going to be at some point next year. Uh, it's almost certainly not going to be this year. So. And what is your your recommendation for what GBN should do? Well, I, th I think it should do the you know the the, the full uh, the full um, 
set of recommendations that we put in our report and 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 maybe the the one that we are uh, we have been communicating more widely is that UK needs to have a, a program of new nuclear builds. Um, so having Hinkley Point C and Sizewell C is is not enough to address our energy security needs and actually address our net zero commitments as well. Um, and I think if you just have you know one power station after that, um, it's it's not enough because you know there is a lot of momentum when you have a program and uh, and also savings to be had when you have a program too. Um, yeah. So we just need to you know commit to a program of of power stations. You know, I like ten so or twenty gigawatts. Medium, sorry, like ten or twenty gigawatts. Did you guys uh, recommend how many like how much capacity you want to install? So I think the energy security strategy was, I, I want to get my numbers right. I think it was 20 by 2050. Um, That's good. But it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's in, the, in a published energy security strategy would be the right number. And um, uh, under a competitive system or under a monopolistic system? Uh, I think that's for government to decide. Okay, so your guys' recommendation doesn't actually talk about like what factors might influence the likelihood of success of a big program? So I think we, we made recommendations against different topics. So I was involved in the more operating model and kind of functionality topic, uh, but there would be, uh, so there were other streams, so there was a stream looking at sort of technology selections, there was a stream looking at site selection, there was a stream looking at, at finance and um, supply chain and regulatory regime on, on lots of other topics too. Great, great, cool. Okay, well, we're almost running out of time, so I want to give you the final oh, word. Sure. Any message for our audience in general? Um, well, I, I think perhaps one thing I wanted to to pick up is uh, my role in in women in nuclear. Okay. Um, so I think the one way we would really change uh, change the future of the industry if we make the industry a lot more a lot more diverse, a lot more inclusive, and um, our commitment we have within women in nuclear is to to get 40% of women into the industry by 2030, um, and also to increase the number of senior um, leaders we have who are, who, who are women. So we want to get to 30% of, of them. Um, and I guess in terms of you know, the overall message, um, so you know, we, we want to make sure that uh, nuclease is an essential part of, of any mix for any country. Uh, we really need this for energy security, we really need nuclear to combat climate change. And, you know, maybe sometimes people who haven't worked in nuclear know anybody from nuclear, they may not realize just how how, how fun it could be and how very different jobs are. Um, and I think there is some, something for everybody, you know, if, if you're into complex technical engineering things, there is plenty to get involved in design. You can do you know, anything from calculations to modeling. Um, if you if you like more of a kind of hands on work, then you could be involved in construction, and you could be you know almost like a skilled artisan in manufacturing. And um, if you just like a job for life, then you know you can join Generation, and you you have sixty years of uh, of do, doing what you love. Uh, and what I particularly like is that one of my, my colleagues says that you know even jobs that you think well surely there couldn't be anything like that in nuclear. So if somebody wanted to be a makeup artist. You can still get involved because we practice our emergency arrangements and sometimes we need to like you know paint people's faces to look like they're casualty on accident. So you can even do that. Um so so I think you know nuclear is, is is a great place to be because we have a variety of problems to solve. You could feel like you're part of a family, um, you know, especially when you're on a power station. And also if you if you like nature and if you like outdoor sports, you know, we have so much beautiful nature around all of our sites. So I think. You know, anybody could find something that would really excite them. Maria Kolnitska, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate your time and all you're doing for the industry and hope to speak to you soon. Thank you, Brett. It's been a pleasure. Really humbled to be invited. Thank you. And initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversations. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress toward peace.